Hello and thanks for joining us. Coming up, the mother and the whore, faster pussycat kill kill. Welcome to Encore's weekly film show where we're talking about some rather interestingly named old movies. Votre sex, Alexandre, n'a pour moi aucune importance. Ce qui est très amusant entre nous, c'est qu'il y a quelqu'un qui se prend au sérieux et quelqu'un qui ne se prend pas au sérieux. For your own safety, see faster pussycat. Kill, kill. Wild women, wild wheels. Race the fastest pussycats and they'll beat you. <laughs> And we're joined in the studio by our film critic, Lisa Nesselson. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Eve. Welcome to the show. Now, we're starting with a retrospective in Paris that highlights the career of one of cinema's most fetid yet unfamiliar auteurs. And it's also your chance to tell us why a three-and-a-half-hour black-and-white movie is one of your favourite films of all time. Oh, yay. I was still in high school in Chicago when I saw this movie, written and directed by Jean Eustache, for the first time, and the title was considered so daring that they couldn't print it in the newspapers. The Mother and the Whore, uh, in ads and on the theatre marquee, was The Mother and the W, followed by four very salacious asterisks. I honestly didn't notice that it was a three and a half hour long movie because time flew by back then and as it has on every occasion since I've seen it, uh, as I've seen it since. And not that it's easy to see because it has never been released on DVD and if there was a copy in a lending library or a, a video rental store, it was stolen a very long time ago, which is why. The fact that this month in Paris at the Cinémathèque Française they are doing a retrospective that will show my favorite French movie no less than three times uh, from now through May 21st, uh, the wonderful films of Jean Eustache. Let's take a look at The Mother and the Whore. Ce qui est très amusant entre nous, c'est qu'il y a quelqu'un qui se prend au sérieux et quelqu'un qui ne se prend pas au sérieux. Devinez qui se prend au sérieux. De vous deux ou de nous trois De nous deux, d'Alexandre et de moi. Écoute, Marie, permets-moi au moins une fois. Mais je te permets. Permets-moi, je t'en prie, Marie. Permets-moi pour une sombre histoire de cul. Here we go, a clip from The Mother and the Whore. May I ask what it's about? Not to get pretentious, but it's about life itself. Uh, Jean-Pierre Léo plays Alexander, who fits the stereotype of the Parisian dandy who whiles away time having philosophical conversations in cafes uh, while juggling his feelings for more than one woman. <laughs> Alexander is pretty much financially supported by Marie, brilliantly played by the late Bernadette Lafont. She runs a dress shop, and Alexander lives with her in the apartment that she pays for. Mature behavior isn't one of Alexander's strong suits, but Marie pretty much accepts that because, after all, Alexander is adorable. He strikes up an intense friendship with Veronica, a nurse who spends her spare time in cafes smoking cigarettes. She's played by Françoise Lebrun, who wasn't trained as an actress but turned out to be an absolutely superb one. Veronica is an independent woman. We can tell that she's been hurt now and again. And she and Alexander hook up, as the youngsters say nowadays. Uh, who's the mother? Who's the whore? There is no neat quiz show type answer. This movie is both funny and heartbreaking. Every word, every comma was written by Eustache based very closely on his own life and the whole thing flows as if it's being lived right before our eyes. It's art. And so why is it your favorite French film? Ah, well, bear with me. There's a lot of art imitating life here. For example, uh, Lebrun had been the director's girlfriend in real life, and Lafont was playing the director's current real-life girlfriend, yeah, Catherine Garnier, who came up with the costumes for the film. Portions of the movie were shot in her apartment and in the boutique she ran. Some of the dialogue echoed her real pronouncements and their actual arguments, which Eustache apparently tape-recorded without her knowledge. Garnier commits suicide after the first showing of the film, and she left a note that said, don't change a thing, it's magnificent. Call me silly, but I don't think movies like Star Wars have that effect on people. Uh, Eustache didn't make that many more films before he, too, commits suicide, but he left an extraordinary number of post-wave classics. Uh, another one is Une Sale Histoire, in which Michael Lonsdale uh, tells the story of how he became converted to voyeurism. Now, if you want to learn more about all this and you read French, you should learn French just to read this book. Uh, it's a, a new book by Luc Perrault, who was Eustache's assistant on the three of his films. It's full of
of juicy details, but it's also written for the layman, and it tells you what goes into making a movie, who does what. It's terrific. In cinema, if uh, not in politics, this retrospective is the most important thing happening in France this month, aside from that small film festival they hold in Cannes. And uh, the reaction to the screening of The Mother and the Whore at Cannes in 1973, in fact, is one of those scandals they still talk about. It was ahead of its time, and it's timeless. Okay, well, onto a French film that's much easier to see as it's out in France this week. It's called De Toutes Mes Forces, um, which roughly translates as With All My Might. I enjoyed this film enormously. Newcomer Khaled Alouche is superb as Nassim, a resourceful teenager who never knew his father and loses his mother uh, before the opening credits are over with. He commutes 40 minutes each way to the rather nice Paris high school he attended before being orphaned. But instead of admitting that he, he's been placed in a modest government facility for mostly wayward minors, Nassim maintains the charade that he's living with an uncle in a classy suburb. So he set up two separate realities and he has to navigate all the pitfalls that implies. In the shelter he loses his virginity to a rather aggressive lower class young woman but at school he's courting a well-bred young lady from an intellectual family. Let's take a look. Pourquoi je pourrais pas rester au lycée comme les autres T'as vu tes notes Dès qu'il y a une difficulté, tu baisses les bras, t'as pas la niaque. Si tu veux faire partie de leur monde à tes camarades de classe, là, donne-toi au moins les moyens. Ta maman est décédée parce qu'elle prenait trop de médicaments. Vous avez du mal à dire le mot de... le mot suicide. Maman, t'es la part de moi que je vais emporter. La part de nous qui ne va pas mourir. Now, this largely autobiographical tale by co-writer and director Chad Chanuga is deeply cinematic. You had a taste of it there. And it defies expectations at several turns. We think we've seen this story before, but in fact, we have it because it's about juggling two realities that must never, ever intersect while trying to cope with possibly overwhelming and absolutely justified melancholy and grief. The performances are completely convincing as our hero and his friends screw up and grow up. Okay, well, next to a film that was a massive hit in its native Korea, this week the tunnel opens in France. Tell us more. Well, our hero is driving home with a cake for his young daughter's birthday. He enters a recently opened tunnel dug out of the side of a mountain, and let's just say the workmanship isn't quite what it should be. I won't tell you how long he ends up trapped underground, but it's more than one day. He has a bottle of water and that cake, and he has a cell phone, which works, although he's stuck under an awful lot of debris. Uh, but we all know that cell phone batteries run down eventually. Uh, let's take a look. <laughs> So either he gets rescued or he doesn't. How do they keep it interesting? Uh, well, um, the, the, first of all, the actors are huge stars in Asia, and so they know how to be suspenseful while looking gorgeous. Uh, and uh, the tension never lets up. The man in charge of the rescue effort is extremely devoted. The government and the company that built the tunnel in the first place, uh, uh, there's all sorts of political undertones. It's costing too much. There's a political subtext that stings, but it works very, very well as a suspense thriller. And when I ride the Paris Metro, I just assume it's not going to come crashing in on my head. So I think most people can identify with the situation. Okay, well, just before we go, um, the 1965 exploitation classic Faster Pussycat Kill Kill, what a great name, is being re-released <laughs> in France this week. Tell us about the very independent American director, Russ Mayer. I have no idea what you're talking about. He's news to me. No, actually, I had the privilege of interviewing Russ Meyer back in 1983 when the French Cinémathèque did a retrospective of his films. The titles alone are glorious examples of truth in advertising. Vixen, Super Vixens, and Beneath the Valley of the Ultra Vixens. Meyer honed his filming skills in the Army in World War II, and he claimed that he lost his virginity uh, in a brothel here in France that was recommended by none other than Ernest Hemingway. He really was an auteur. He thought up, cast, produced, directed, filmed, edited, and distributed his own band of, brand of movie, which always involved 
buxom women. And back there in the 50s and 60s, if you saw a well-endowed woman, um, that was absolutely uh, authentic. There was not that kind of plastic surgery. You have to remember that before the internet, um, it was harder to come by, you know, girly movies and this sort of thing. He didn't make porn. He made things that were kind of wholesome by today's standards or lack of them. Um, he um, died in 2004 at age 82. And I'd say he wasn't his way a proto-feminist because he was really in awe of women. OK, well, Lisa, thank you so much for joining us and telling us all about these exciting old films. We're going to leave you with Faster Pussycat Kill Kill. Remember our website? We're also on Twitter and Facebook. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. All right, here's how it works. Everybody's got to go. You name it, we've got it. On ladylike karate chops, on gentlemanly haymakers, spirited gymnastics, corrective table attic, sandbox jousting, or a muscle-bound cat wrestling with a roaring sports car that's intent upon squashing him like a grape. Bizarre kidney and chassis rattling chases. And for the first time on the screen, a haymaking, belly busting, karate chopping, judo flipping fight to end them all. France 24 is getting ready to bring you all the action from the French presidential election. Stay informed of all the developments with our reports, debates and analysis. The outcome could have implications across the world. Second round, May 7th. Follow the French presidential election on France 24 